We want a united Ireland. We believe that that is the best chance that, that our nation has to achieve its full potential. We believe that Ireland has been held back as a nation. But we are not going to try and be involved in any coercion attempt. And the difference between East Belfast playing on cut grass or broken glass could be a statement for me. Well, it's that time of the week again, and I know it's a cliche, but time literally does fly by, Mary. Is it because we're getting older or what, that weeks don't seem to last as long as they used to last? (laughs) I think it's lovely because it's the time of the year. We're here and it's springtime. There's a a smell of spring in the air. There's a freshness. We've come out of the dark days. Oh, the longer days. I love the longer days. Yeah, so do I. And there's growth. And there's new beginnings. And really, I suppose that kind of segues really nicely into our theme for today about new beginnings. Yes, because, <laughs> well, we have the man who is going to lead the GAA into probably the newest beginning since the day it was founded. Um, and you've those, had your part to yeah, play well, with yes, the and in fact, that'll be part of it. integration. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, the GAA has been um, and is one of the most extraordinary phenomena, not just in Ireland, but worldwide. I don't think there's anything to match it really worldwide. So we're joined, of course, uh, this morning by uh, Jarlath, uh, Jarlath Burns, who is the president uh, of the GAA and uh, an Armagh man through and through. Right, Jarlath? Absolutely. You're uh, very uh, welcome here, Jarlath. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> welcome to very Alan welcome. Wood. And we know that your journey... Uh, Your journey in the GAA is, it's just so deep, it's so wide, it's so profound. It's no wonder you were voted in as president on the first count, may I say, which was a matter of great pride to those of us who are, even though we're down people, we still have pride (laughs) in what Narma Man has accomplished. But I'm looking at a career, 13 seasons you were a player um, at a very, very senior level from 87 to 99, playing with Arma. Um, and you must have great memories of those days, and in particular a day when you might have lifted a special cup or two. That's right. Uh, you were there that day. Mary, I know you weren't supporting us. Uh, you're a, as a proud down person, and you're actually in all of the photographs uh, of Danny Murphy, another great uh, GA man. person, yeah, and a down, a burn man. I was, that's something I'm very, very proud of, because 13 years is a long time to play for any county, um, and to win zero, to win nothing throughout that time, apart from a couple of McKenna Cups, um, it would be very easy to say if, if I hadn't won, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was worthwhile. But it really was, even if I had never won that title, because what it does to you, it does create your character, your temperament, gives you great resilience. You need all of those things, because when you're a GAA county player, it's all about giving. You're giving your time, which is the most precious commodity that you have. And you have to be obedient. You have to watch what you're doing, how you're behaving, because everybody knows you. Everybody's watching you. Um, and there was, an, uh, there was a lot came together. It was 13, 17 years since Arma had won an Ulster. And I had been there for 13 of them. And to win it uh, in that way and to win it in such style was a fantastic. You're rubbing yeah. it in now to the dime. <laughs> well, it, 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 to hear there, win it that way, win it with such style. It, well, it, it, it <laughs> just happened to be fairness. that down were there that day. It wouldn't yeah. matter what other county was there, we would have celebrated the same way. And remember, down had won in All Ireland just five years previous. They had. Uh, so getting to notice the final for down there were a wee bit nonchalant about it. It was yes, yeah, nice to be in a Ulster final, but for our ma, it was just when incredible. you've waited, when you've waited, yeah, yeah, when you've waited so long for it with with so many false sons. And remember, there was no back door, there was no uh, chance of getting back in. What you we were, used to do either was, in or out. Yeah, in. once you were beaten. You, know, you almost reinvented it all, not realizing that you were so close. All you had to just keep going, keep going, and the following year, it might just happen for you. We we were going back the following year and starting again, when all we had to do is just keep doing what we were doing and give another little nudge, and we would get there. You got over the line. We did, and uh, I retired that year. I think it was thirty three, and. Thankfully, that team that we had really laid the foundation for 2002 gave us the, gave the boys the belief that they could that they could win it, and they went on and won the All Ireland. How did you feel that day, the day they won the All Ireland, and you weren't lifting the Sam McGuire? <laughs> well, if anybody wants to know how I was feeling, I was actually in the BBC studio, uh, and to watch all my friends uh, that had soldiered with me. Uh, on that moment, whenever it was finished, it was just such 
an emotional surge came that I ran out of the studio and I, I actually wanted to jump down. I would have killed myself if I had done so because <laughs> we were in the, in the premium level. That's where the BBC studio was. And it, it's really unheard of and, and the number one cardinal sin to do that, uh, to leave a studio when you're just about to go on air, live on air. And what BBC did in fairness, whenever it came back to the studio, Martin McHugh was there with Jerome Quinn and there was an empty seat. Because I didn't realise we were going back live so quickly. And instead of giving off to me, they actually replayed the last moments of the match and me watching it and eating my fingernails. And, and then <laughs> whenever it, 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 it the final whistle went running out of the studio and you could see celebrating because it was just all, everything that you wanted in your life was there. And did you not feel a, d a deep sense of frustration that that you weren't yourself there lifting the Sam Maguire? There's always going to be that. You're always going to feel that, that you, you, you want to be there. But I was, I think it was 34, 35 then at that stage. I would have been probably last sub. I would have been just hanging on. My position on the team, as it happened, was taken by Stephen McDonald, who was a past pupil of mine, went on to be an absolute star in his own right, got uh, an all-star that year. And, you know, when people say to me, were you not disappointed you weren't there? And I tell them that, no, Stephen McDonald played in my place very quickly to realise, no, it was better for our <laughs> man. And thus, whenever you're a county player or even a club player, it's never about yourself. It has to be always about the team. Well, I remember um, on the eve of the All Ireland, you came into the uh, the Up for the Match studio, and like the and with all the supporters from Armagh, it was just electric. I was able because I wasn't part of the panel. I was able to savor those weeks coming up to the match and uh, really enjoy the build up and the hype and everything else, and go on to Up for the Match and then be part of the media on the day of the match and in the aftermath, I emceed a lot of the post-match events. And I suppose I was able to experience in, in a really universal manner what it was like to build up. Whereas the players were, their, their families were all uh, dealing with it on They're their cocooned. behalf. They were <laughs> cocooned, they were staying. Away. And I remember even in 99, myself, uh, Suzanne, my wife, having a conversation with Benny Tierney's mother, Nora, outside Mass in Monopan. And they were talking about what they were doing for nerves themselves. <laughs> and Suzanne was talking about, well, I've taken rescue remedy and Nora was saying what she was doing and what medicine she was on. And, and on the way back to Mass, I said, is that really, is that true, that conversation? She said, yeah, you don't know what it's like. We are taking everything on your behalf so all you can focus on even tickets for the match was another source of of stress that our families took on We're so we pressure. didn't have to so people tend to forget what had, particularly now with um social media um we try and our best to keep even being in this in the in the, in the public eye now I keep myself away from all of that. I know that there is somebody out there called Jarlath Burns that some people like, some people don't like, but it's not who I am. Sometimes it's hard to explain that to family members if they see something written about you or said about you and they're very upset. It is very difficult for the families. And remember, all of this uh, comes back to the most important value we have, which is our amateur status. At least in the Premier League, if you're getting 100,000 a week, it's not too bad if you're being criticised, but you get exactly <laughs> the same treatment in the GA. If you're getting nothing. If you're getting nothing for it. And you're, you're president of the GAA in an era when the GAA is opening up probably the biggest chapter since its foundation. How do you think that is going to sit with you? Because there will be critics, of course, but we know that there is a huge momentum and a wind behind the full integration of women's sports into the Gaelic Athletic Association's family of sports. Well, it, it, it is really exciting because I come from a club where we wouldn't know how to run our club if it wasn't through the full club model. And I would say... 
all of our experiences come within the most the smallest unit of life that we have so for example our family our townland but in the GA it's our club and I would say in our club our club is probably led by men and driven by women uh, <laughs> and it's very hard to talk about this without being patronizing but our club never was any close to being its potential until we started properly involving women in the decision making process. I think that if we can, I, I think the vast majority of clubs are the same. They know exactly what um, what it has brought to their clubs. And I think that we can bring that one step or 10 steps further by having full integration. And the people who are most for it are the females because they are all very proud members of the GAA. They go and support their county teams. They fundraise, they pay. To do all of those things. So they're about uh, 50% of the GAA. And that's notwithstanding the incredible organizations that come and come and LGFA are. They really, really are. And there's an awful lot about them that we can learn from. It's not all about bringing them in and uh, into our ways and everything will be right. You have to understand that there will be fears involved uh, with LGFA and, and Camogie Association, and we have to be mindful of that. And as you say, learn from them. Uh, oh, absolutely. If you look at, for example, the All-Ireland uh, Ladies Football Day, they were way ahead of us in terms of having you know, a three-tiered approach. And look, I was at the All-Ireland final this year, and I saw Down, who actually won the junior, uh, and... I, we're in the u- unique position of vocally supporting down because one of our staff members, Kiva Sloan, was, <laughs> was the manager. <laughs> and, and well, she was manager. She was manager right, yeah. And it was such an incredible moment for them. It was like winning their All-Ireland. We have, because the GA is so much in hock to tradition, we have found it a longer journey to get to the stage of having a secondary competition and probably... I could say in the next five or six years, there will be a junior competition as well. We have a lot to learn. And Jarlath, when you're embarking now on uh, your term of office, that's obviously going to be something that's central to the the work that you're doing. You've already mentioned amateurism. That's going to be something else. Are there other kind of key factors that you want to, I suppose, do something about in the three years? Yeah, well, if you listen to the speech that I made at uh, Congress in the Canal Court in Uri um, in the end of February, a lot of people were surprised that I spent a long time talking about hurling because, I mean, South Armagh is hardly a hotbed of hurling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but all my children have played hurling. I never got an opportunity to play it myself. And I had to make a particularly big sacrifice to get my sons to play hurling. Um, so I know what it's like to have to struggle to get that come on into your hand and get hit in the slither. And I think that there's been an incredible amount of work has been done in the last 10, 15 years to to push hurling. We are still a long way off. If you draw mm-hmm. a line between Dublin and Castlebar, north of that, the prairie fire of the GA has not caught. Sure. And it's left to very zealous, dedicated hurling people to promote hurling against its biggest rival, which is Gaelic football. And Armagh will never compete in the Liam McCarthy Cup until we have more than eight clubs in our county. And I think that the next stage of development within hurling has to be to make it easy to create hurling within clubs, to create new hurling clubs. You're going to have a busy, busy time. Well, I will, Mary, but the way the GA works we can call on a vast amount of voluntary assistance from some of the best legal minds, some of the best scientific minds, medical minds, because of the committee structure in the GA, which is much maligned, but which is the vehicle through which all change happens. So I am very satisfied that the committees that I have formed are going to work on each of those. They're going to work very, very hard. And they're going to allow me then to lead, to be you know, in, in the ceremonial elements of the association, going around visiting clubs, doing presentations, which are equally important. And Mary, you will know that when you were president, the day that you visited my school as president, 
in the vast scheme of things, being a president or being in that position, it's, it's very small. But see for the number of inspirations that you give by your words, that leaves an incredible legacy with people. So that's very important that, um, you, that the president of the GA would never see that part as being just ceremonial or just hassle. Mm-hmm. I have to go here. Yet, like I, pa- I passed Allenwood GA on the way here. And on the way back, I'm going to call in and I'm going to walk around, uh, have a wee look. Oh, uh, and they're delighted with themselves yeah, these absolutely. days, aren't they? Uh, they're just a, a brilliant club and mm-hmm. a fantastic setup. So all of those things, and I know that Larry before me, Larry used to love to just show up unannounced to watch a match, a junior B club match in some uh, in some county. That that would be so typical of Larry McCarthy and the type of person that he is. He would be never one for for pomp and ceremony. Just show up and chat to the people. And essentially, that's what the GA president is about. I'm thinking of both of you um, in your roles as president. You okay? You've arrived there now. You've worked really brilliantly and uh, very diligently for so many years as both on the Heron. But like the lead up to it is massive, isn't it? And has a huge toll to take on you personally and also on your family. Well, there were a lot of chicken sandwiches and bags of crisps <laughs> on, on, on campaign trails. But then you've had two campaign trails. Yeah. You know, what was the difference there? You, well, as one, yeah. one of the Gareth Brooks songs sometimes, I thank God for unanswered <laughs> prayers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, th- that time I probably wasn't ready for it. Uh, um, and the GA will usually pick the best person. I remember hearing that. And, and at that stage, the GA was ready for a president from Global GA. And Larry was best placed for that. Uh, and I just think that despite of the fact that I was disappointed, I, I, I was so... I was so enthused about the fact now that people were seeing the GA as a global organization and not just a small Irish organization. And I think that sent out a really, really strong message. We, we are constantly telling pupils in school, you have to have resilience. You have to learn about what it's like to take defeat. Life is tough. It's not easy. You don't get self-esteem just handed to you. You have to build it up. There's no point in me going into a corner and, and going into darkness just because I have lost a vote. Uh, so uh, I just, I, I think I dealt with it well because I was really happy for Larry having won, despite the fact that I lost myself. And I just got on with life back to being secretary of my club and uh, it, uh, I just put all that behind me. And then, and then you ran again. I mean, other people might have said, oh, to heck with it now, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced the, the, the loss. I'm, I'm not, going to, not going to put my head up above the parapet again. It's the normal thing. If you look at the last three presidents, that's Egon O'Farrell and then John Horan and Larry, they were very lucky that they didn't have to go the second time. <laughs> but it's, it's a normal thing <laughs> in the GA that you don't get it the first time and you come back. And I remember uh, mm-hmm. Peter Quinn went twice, Sean McKeague went twice, uh, Paddy McFlynn went three times. I was certainly not going to go for the third time, but I felt that I did owe it to myself and to my club and to not not necessarily my family because they, I remember my fa- my late father who passed away last year, Lord of Mercy, and I'm a, a, such a rational, brutal, ordinary man and I'm saying to me, why would you want to be going for that whenever you have a job just five miles in the road there that's, that's paying you well? So why would you want to go for that? Sure, you, you, you'd be happy enough with that. And that was just the sort of my father. He didn't want to see me being hurt. I wore two things throughout going around all of the country and on the night of election. I wore my father's tie, which I thought gave me great strength, and Mickey Trainer. Uh, who was a fantastic uh, stalwart around our club, wore his pioneer pin. And he had uh, he had died not uh, not long prior to that. So You're a pioneer. All my life I have never touched oh, alcohol yet. Yeah. And it's another man who greatly influenced me in my life would have been Hugh McCauley, who was my primary seven teacher in Collihanna. He taught me to love the Irish language. And he also taught me to 
all of us, he gave us great education in the work that Irish saints had done in, 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 in Europe. But he also talked to us quite a lot about temperance. I realized very quickly in my life that I have a very addictive personality. Anything I take on with, I very often become obsessed with mm-hmm. it. And I knew probably if I'd taken alcohol, I could have become an alcoholic. I, I've met an awful lot of people who have regretted ever taking their first drink. As the head of and the principal of a Catholic school, you're, you know, you're deeply immersed in, in teaching in Catholic education. Tell me your vision of that, because I think people will be very surprised to hear your vision. Well, the first thing I would say is that um, Catholic education is not education for Catholics. So, for example, we don't have a mission statement as such. It's just two words for the first, second and third year. Keep talking to them. Be kind. Fourth and fifth year, it's show compassion. And sixth and seventh year, it's have integrity. Those six words become what, what we try and do. Now, it's very easy to take for granted and, and, and for what exactly Catholic education is about until you compare it to models of education in other, in other societies. So, for example, if you go into France, it's not child-centered. It's obviously not Christian-based or Catholic-based. It's their mission statement is very simple, to make each citizen, each person, a good citizen of France. There is no mention of the social work that you do or the pastoral care or anything like that. That's separate and distinct. And you can see that the French people as a result are very patriotic. So when our Megan, for example, then went to teach in Qatar, education is just a business there. There is absolutely, they wouldn't know what you were talking about if you talked about child-centered or putting the child at the heart of everything. It's just all about making money there. The church sees itself as a teacher. The church is a teacher. I must say one of the proudest days for me was when you led your young, uniformed school boys and girls in Newry's first Pride Parade. And first of all, it was a wonderful thing for young, for for me as the mother of a gay son, um, who'd been through Catholic schools but had been terrified a lot of the time. Um... And who, looking at a, a headmaster, a school principal, um, in a school that where the patron is the archbishop, and the courage that took. Tell me about that, because you changed lives that day. I, I remember well, I wasn't too long a principal, and um, when I had been vice principal in charge of pastoral care and safeguarding in the school, um, there was a fellow come in one day, a seventh year boy, and he had a few marks on his on his face. And I, I took him into my office because you'll always be you'll always question if you see a young person marked. I said to him, "Is is that something that happens regularly?" And the more we talked, the more he got into his confidence and into his trust. And he said something to me that was very worrying. He says, "But there's nothing can be done for me." The next day, and a few more fellas came to me, and then girls and. I became quite friendly with them and we, w- we would have met in my office very regularly for coffee. And then this came up, the Pride Parade, and they said, sir, why don't you come down with us? Uh, and I said, I will, surely. And they said, but we want to wear our uniforms. And I said, yeah, why not? Uh, and we went and it didn't seem to be a big deal for me. Right enough now, it did garner quite a lot. I didn't think it would get a lot of, as, as much publicity. Um, and in the middle of the following week, I actually got a phone call then from a parent. And she said, listen, just want to say that over the summer, my son came out to my father and myself. And to his I father? Accept, yeah, I accepted it. Correct, yeah. Uh, but my father didn't because he wanted him to play football and be a farmer like him, and he wasn't interested in any of that. And I took it okay, but my husband has has had a very difficult summer accepting it, and he hasn't said much, and there hasn't been much communication in our house. And he was in McParland's shop in Monaghan Street, uh, and he came out and he, he said, if Jareth Burns, who played for Armagh and is an all-action male, can walk in a pride parade 
honoring my son and others like it. Surely I can accept my son. And he says, he came home and he hugged my son and said, I love you very much. Oh my God. And for me, that was incredible vindication. Also, your son, Justin, wrote to me. Uh, And I'm going to tell you this. I needed that at the time. Because it wasn't all plain sailing. I bet well, you were out on a lot of conversations and other were, letters. Yeah, well, I that got weren't so helpful. The middle pages in a particularly right wing publication uh, <laughs> were all sorts of things written with me. But again, that's where your family come in and they support you, and other people support you, and you get on with it. And I'm, I have to say, I'm very proud that that was something that we did, and that we sent out a very strong message. No matter who you are, what you are, there's a place for you in our school. And then, of course, the next big argument now is about transgender. We have transgender children in our school. Uh And I know these children, all they want to do is just live a quiet life. Keep away from me. I don't want to be in that argument. Just allow me to be who I am. And that's what we do. And you're with them. Exactly, yes. Jarlath, you speak with such passion and commitment to your school, St. Paul's. How do you feel about kind of leaving that to one side as Uthran? That's been the most difficult part Uh uh, because every single morning for 30, 40 years, I got up and I drove to my work in St. Paul's. Um, The children of South Arma are a very special breed. They're extremely generous. very nosy. I always say to some <laughs> teachers coming to our school, you will not be in the class five minutes till they'll have asked you every single question. And if you're a young male teacher, the 50 year girls will have gone and checked out your Instagram and your Facebook and all of those things. Just accept that and be very careful what you do. But the, the, the children in our school are the kindest you will ever get. So just to answer your question, yeah, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But I didn't go off in any fanfare. I just slipped off because it is my full intention at this stage to return when my three years of convent is over. Uh, Jarla, can we go back a little bit to uh, the GAA and the part it played in your life growing up? You were born in 1967, which was um, coming up to the the trouble. So all through that and being um, the GAA you know, in Northern Ireland at uh, that time was so, so different to the GA we knew down in uh, the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, it was. And um, 1967 was, coming. you know, the, the, the height of the civil rights movement. Both my parents were very much involved. Bloody Son, they came along and then that famous march in Newry. Again, my parents heavily involved in that, as was everybody. All we one man, one vote. I mean, it, it, it's not, it wasn't an irrational uh, request to make. Um, at that time, it's been well written about the incredible discrimination that Catholics faced in the North. And one of the things that really struck me was that that game that we were playing out in the back garden, Gaelic uh, and you know, you watched television and you saw it on the, t- on the television in Croke Park. That was also the game that we played. And there was an incredible connection there when people would stand for the national anthem and face our flag. Uh, in a place where people were telling us we were anything but what we wanted to be. And um, at the GA just made sense of a lot of things that in a world where very, very little things made sense to us. And it was always a comfort blanket. You went down to the club, there was people there who look after you and to keep an eye on you and to coach you and to give you all of the skills that you needed. It's just, we, we in the North owe the GA so much. I don't think that story has been properly told. I suppose it was for us a nonviolent way of saying we are Irish, we're very proud to be Irish. And this is how we are going to demonstrate our Irishness by playing our games. It was such uh, a non-aggressive way of, of being Irish and promoting your identity. And at that time, I would have been very heavily involved in score, quiz and in recitation and solo singing and all of those things. These things really assisted us. 
I live in South Armagh. So all of those things were really impacting on us. And then in, on the 19th of December, 1975, Silver Bridge became very much a part of it when Donnelly's pub was attacked. We all knew at that time that they were all part of the collusion agenda. And it's been proven since then that it was. And just the injustice of life at the time the fears that all of our parents had that we were going to get involved in the IRA, that was a real thing. And I suppose for me, it was the GAA that kept a lot of us away from the IRA. And that story has never been properly appreciated maybe by the unionist community. Many of whom, but not all of whom, many of whom will criticise the GAA for things that we know we can be criticised about. But they've never really reflected on the fact that the GAA did so much to give young men an outlet for their physicality, that they could play the games and be proud to be Irish. It's a sense of identity, isn't it? Well, it is. It's, if you look at it it's in its purest form, and it, it feeds into this specifically Irish thing of love of place. And I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said that there is no such thing as community or society, just individual people trying their best. And I mean, I always said if Margaret Thatcher said it, it must be wrong. <laughs> but the, 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 the Irish psyche is very much involved in love of place, love of your townland, love of where you're from and with love of place in the GA, because the GA isn't all 100% positive, also comes hatred of the other place <laughs> <laughs> and the bitter, the rivalry that you have for the neighbouring parish uh, put so well by people like John B. Keane and, and people like that. Uh, I think that's what the essence of the GA is. And are all of those things in your head now as your um, president of the, the, the GAA for the next three years? Yeah, they are. Go back to the GA's love of place. Um, I'm secretary of my club, Silver Bridge, and I have been, I'm going to maintain being secretary while I'm president. And part of that is because I love being secretary of the club. Um, people in the club say that, yeah, you were chairman before, but you've stayed on as secretary because like Stalin, he never became the leader of the <laughs> Communist Party, but he knew that's where the power was. <laughs> but as well as that, I think that... Um, it's important you send out a signal, you know what it's like to be in a club. Even though you're the leader of this incredible association, that you're secretary of your own club and maintain that position, that you send out a signal that um, it's all about the grassroots. It has to be about the grassroots. The GA is a bottom-up organisation. So all of those things will be in my mind, along with the bigger ideas whenever you're president. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship then between the GAA and the national issue, the issue of partition and reunification, you're a border man. How does that, that link with the GAA um, affect your view, your vision for the future? Because you're living through times now, and as president of the GAA, when, if you like, the onward march of the demographic changes in Northern Ireland are pushing more and more people to talk about the potential, at least, for reunification. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. I think we have to be very careful with it. Uh, the GA has always just ignored partition. That's how we dealt with it. Just ignored it as if it doesn't exist. Um, we still operate our, our 32 counties and obviously the global GA. We stand proudly for the flag and the anthem. We do all of those things which are very important to us. And I suppose if you want to find out about the GA, look at the first two words. You know, we are Gaelic, the Gaelic Athletic Association. That's what we are and we're very proud to be that. And it's not subversive to be that. And it's not subversive to have a dream. But it's, I suppose it's how we achieve that is very important. And, the, and where the GA is going to be in that. We try to stay away from the major party political issues. We don't involve ourselves. And I think that great leadership has been given by Ulster GA in that, particularly by Brian McAvoy. I think that we try and stay away from all of those things. So, for example, with the whole debate around casement. Having said that, we can't bury our heads in the sand and but our, our involvement will be very simple. We want a united Ireland. We believe that that is the best chance that, that our nation has. Ireland has been held back as a nation. But we are not going to try and be involved in any coercion attempt. And we are going to, at all times, understand the single biggest GA movement at the moment that is going on is the development of the GA in East Belfast. And the difference between East Belfast playing on cut grass or broken glass could be a statement. So what's the next three years going to be like for Jarlath Burns? It's Obviously, it's going to be very busy, Mary, but I'm used to having a busy life. Uh, and it's going to be involved in a lot of travel. But 
I'm really looking forward to it. And it's going to bring challenges and there's going to be moments of controversy. And I know that, you know, we'll be waking up some morning to something that has happened that we weren't aware of that was happening. It's very simple things. For example, um, we discovered three or four years ago that the Schlitters were, were being made in places which were not really in keeping with the values of the GA. We have a committee that's been led by Ned Quinn and Kit Kilkenny, who has been working for three years to produce sustainably produced slithers. Now, we discovered that ourselves, but imagine if somebody else had discovered it and I was having to respond to this. You can never tell where a controversy is going to come from. And for the Burns family, what's the next three years going to be like? Well, Suzanne has retired from her work, so she is up for the challenge of going around with me and she'll be great company and she is a great advisor to me as well. She keeps me right. She tells me when I've said something stupid or done something <laughs> stupid. I can, I can, you I can, can vouch for that. Can vouch for that yes. <laughs> in the typical <laughs> brutal West Belfast <laughs> way in which yes. she is known. Yes. But um, I remember asking Egon O'Farrell, what is it like? And he said, you're always in a place where there's so much positivity and you're dealing with people who are high functioning and who are working very hard in their clubs. So... I think that I'm that part of it I'm really looking forward to. I'm just looking forward to getting into clubs as well. Um, just before Christmas, a few months back, um, the GAA got a phenomenal uh, gift, gift from JP mm. McManus. What do you think of that? 32 million? But JP is a GA man through and through who Isn't understands me? what the GAA does in every community uh, and that they don't always get the help that they deserve to do what they do and... I know in our club, for example, we are now building on to our resource centre and it's building on to help with the uh, preschool playgroup that's there and the homework club that's there. And we haven't got any funding for that. We are doing that ourselves. And none of that is anything to do with the core values of the GA, but we're doing it because we're a community-based organisation. The money that we have got from JP has helped us to build that. Mm. And the last money that we got actually helped from him when he gave three million, helped, we needed a new generator that bought the generator. And every time we switch on the lights, we thank God for J.P. McManus. <laughs> and I know that there will be people who will say, talk about tax and talk about all of those things. But at the end of the day, J.P. McManus is paying his tax. He's um, doing what he has to do. And he, for him to give that gift to the Gaelic Athletic Association is an incredible vote of confidence in what our people are doing up and down the country and trusting them with the money. Because, you know, every club has to publish its accounts every year. And um, we are scrutinised like no other organisation. And that is correct. Mm -hmm. We should be. But we are all so proud of what he has done. And he is such a modest man. He would not want any credit for that. I know in Croke Park, I actually went up to him and said to him, you won't know who I am, but we use the money that you gave us to buy a new generator. And he was just almost embarrassed. But I know that he is a very proud member of the GAA. You certainly changed the story for Limerick. He oh, did, yes. yeah. And he would not want any credit for that. He would say at the end of the day, it's the players had to put that slither over the bar and they had to catch the ball and they had to do all of the training and they had to make all the sacrifices. You're very proud of the amateur status, the volunteers that keep it going, the future. How do you see the amateur status in the future and how that can be held on to when there is a momentum that looks like it's increasingly professionalising the sports? Well, if you listen to my speech in, at Congress, I want to put the amateur status right at the heart. If you look, um, JP has given us 32 million. Well, last year we spent that exact amount on preparing county teams. Uh, and that's not a good use of our money. Uh, and every aspect has become professional, apart from one thing, and that is the players. That has to continue. But I think that we have to put in more protection, protection for their time. Uh -huh. I, I have very ambitious plans, which may not work, I have to say. This has to row us back into the number of people we have in backroom teams, the, number, the size of panels, all of those things. Because every, email, every day when I open my emails, you'll see some county board, they're either running a race day or they're, they're raffling a car or raffling a house or doing something and it's just really, really causing and causing so much stress at, in county boards trying to keep that going. And they really can't. So it's up to us to try and do something. Are you optimistic about uh, uh, how that'll work out, Charles? <sighs> I'm realistic, Mary, rather than optimistic, because every county, I've canvassed each county in Ireland and in England as well, twice now in the last three years. And I don't blame the managers, because the managers have, have to 
perform to the expectation of the supporters. So, for example, last year, Armagh, everybody wanted Armagh to win the Ulster. So whatever it was going to take to win the Ulster, you, you had to do it. So you can't blame managers because managers are trying to do what the will of the county wants. But it's going in three directions, all of this money. A third of it is going on travelling expenses. A third of it is going on hotels. And a third of it is going on bus companies. Round about, almost. And that's not a good use of our money. We need to start thinking of getting back to the roots of why we have a county game. There's one thing for sure with all of that money. It hasn't made Gaelic football any more attractive to watch. So that's a good starting point. If you could change one thing, one thing right now during your presidency, whether it's in the GAA, whether it's in Ireland, what would it be, do you think? I would love to be able to change the mentality of some people who think that the GAA is all about Croke Park making people do things. So, for example, if you look at hurling, which is such a passion of my own, it's really the grassroots that's to blame, if we want to apportion blame for that, because a lot of clubs don't want hurling because they're fearful that it might impact on their competitiveness. And it's just trying to make those clubs feel, no, no actually, if you bring hurling into your club, you are going to bring even more people in because children want to play hurling. Children love playing hurling. When children start playing hurling, they almost want to stop playing Gaelic football because it's so wonderful to be able to hit a slither with a stick. And hurling is the native game. Uh, so I think that's the one thing that if I could change, it would be football mentalities around hurling. And just before we finish, and I suppose in a more general sense, is there um, a moment, not necessarily GAA related, a moment or a person that changed your life? It's the day that I went to Collyhanna Primary School and met Hugh McCauley. Because he is the person who gave me my values, particularly my desire to become fluent in the Irish language and to love Irish culture. I know that his family are always a wee bit curious when I mention him all the time, but I would never want to go without mentioning him. That is why... When I became a principal of a school myself, I said, I want to be like him. I want to inspire people like he has inspired me. Mm-hmm. Probably if there was an event that changed my life, it was becoming a member of the Eames Bradley. What were uh, they doing? Explain what, what Eames Bradley was well, doing. Well, Eames Bradley was set up by, really it was, it, was, it was Dennis Bradley's idea that he had said we had dealt with all the political aspects of Northern Ireland and looking at trying to find solutions or resolutions to all of the issues. But we never looked at the past We never looked at what the past had done. There were so many loose ends that had to be tied up with regard to legacy. The report which we published was never really adopted, like so many other reports. And the past has been dealing with us ever since. But your insight into both frames of mind uh, is quite remarkable, Jarlath. Yeah, well, you have to. I I have a complete obsession, as I've said before, with, with the Orange Order. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and with the, because they are also a community-based organisation, they tap into the same love of a community that the GA does. But that's always been, I think, the, the central core of your being is the belief in the great commandment to love one another. Yeah, and I would say this might not always have been the case. The person who actually said to us, suffering of a Catholic mother is the same as a Protestant mother, it doesn't matter what their son has done, was Ian Paisley. And that's not a bad starting point for reconciliation. And that's a man who changed quite dramatically. Yeah, he did. He did. And he, um, and enough, best, to, enough to let hope in. Correct. And, you know, best not to look into his past. Correct. But best to look at his legacy. And while there's safety and sameness, while the people who you reconcile with or the people who you spend all your day with, when they start turning against you, that can be very hurtful. Charlotte, it's been an absolute pleasure to have this uh, conversation with you. So uplifting. Well, it's wonderful. I mean, I've I've known Jarlath for a long time. And I have to say on the day that he was, the day that he headed the Pride Parade in Newry, mm. I knew that we had the makings of the most extraordinary leader. And then when the GAA eventually <laughs> recognised that truth, uh, my heart, as a down woman, you know, <laughs> it's a big thing. Being it's a big thing now. to say. <laughs> That one of the most outstanding leaders of our times is an Arma man, Jarlath Burns. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. 
I'm just so glad to be able to introduce the world to Jarlath Burns. I've known Jarlath a long time. Mm -hmm. And he was a towering figure in Armagh football and in Ulster GAA. He was he is a towering figure in education in the north, not just Catholic education, but education broadly in the north. He's incredibly courageous. And I just think he's one of those people who has grown into a national stature. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad to see him as president of the GAA. Uh -huh. Well, I just so enjoyed hearing him talk. I was blown away by I don't know, how would you describe it? His emotional intelligence, the way that he can read people. As a former teacher, I love the fact uh, that he had this ethos in his school of getting the best out of everybody, of turning nobody away, you know, that and, and, and it's giving not the just disadvantaged. Talk. No, it's not absolutely. just talk. In fact, I, I just think of him, how he how courageous he was to take the young people in his school and say to them when they came to him after the, uh, 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 whenever it was announced to be the first Pride Parade in Newry and, and they'd want to go and they'd want to go in school uniform and he said, well, if we get permission from the Parents Council, sure, I'll go with you. And I'll go with you. And yeah. he did. And he did. And, and I mean, I just think that's just, you know, the, the value that he has. Do you know what I found very interesting as well, Mary, as a, I suppose, a Southerner, um, the, the, the comfort that the GAA provided to him and his peers growing up, like Correct. gave them identity and a sense of belonging. And that it also was kept really a lot of people special. out of trouble. Yeah, he said and that. That was important for mm -hmm. a lot of people, particularly young men at a time when they felt that they belonged to an oppressed community, uh, when they might have been, been very badly treated on the streets, for example, by police or army in the bad old days, and could have been frustrated enough to fall into the hands of a waiting organisation, paramilitary organisation, mm -hmm. just waiting to grab them. And you know what those organisations are like, mm -hmm. once you're in, it's very hard to get out. They strengthened themselves. Mm -hmm. They formed uh, teams and groups and peer groups and mentoring. And that all helped them. Mm -hmm. Every match was a diversion. Every, there was crack, there was fun. There was, in a sense, there, there, as you said, there was community and there was identity. And status. But, but there was absorption of their time. Yeah, that's right. And that meant, that meant so much. There are, there are a lot of young men particularly, but young men and women who have the GAA to thank that it kept them on a straight path away from violence at a time when others were just not so lucky. Uh -huh. Well, I think the GAA has hit the jackpot. I really do. You're so right. Oh I think my he's I think he's going to he is got he is already a towering figure in the GAA, but I think he's going to very quickly become a towering presence in Ireland. Mm, it's wonderful. And next week will be um, a phenomenal week as well, because I think we'll be introducing a lot of people in this country to an amazing woman, Galway woman, Emer Noon, the first woman ever to conduct the orchestra for the Oscars in Hollywood. And my goodness, what a story she has to tell. A Trinity graduate, should I say, a great Trinity graduate. Um, and I have to say, until she stood in front of that orchestra um, at the Oscars, I didn't know much about her. And I'm looking at her thinking, Dear Lord, look at the age of her. I mean, she's just, she looked like a teenager, though she wasn't. A young woman with that confidence. So, Emer Noon, next week. Don't forget to subscribe, folks. Again, it doesn't cost you anything, but it means an awful lot to us. So um, hit the button and tell all your pals. And we'll see you next week.